today on an all-new Dr. Phil, the Natalie Holloway mystery. The man who claimed he helped dispose of her body has just been stabbed to death. Did he tell you where Natalie's remains were? The woman who killed him. He had his arm around my throat and I just started swinging backwards. How did you get the knife away from me? The exclusive interview. They found his backpack which had duct tape in it and gloves. What was he going to do? Beautiful blonde teenager Natalie Holloway vanished in 2005 while on a high school graduation trip. And ever since, her loved ones and the nation have been haunted by her mysterious disappearance. There are so many unanswered questions. Where is Natalie? Is she out there somewhere still alive? If she died, how? Now, after 10 years of dead-end theories and false leads, her name is back in the news after John Ludwig friend of Joran Vandersloot, a longtime prime suspect in Natalie's death, was killed in Florida. Now Ludwig met Joran in Aruba and claims to have helped dig Natalie's grave and cover up her remains. And he was stabbed to death as he reportedly attempted to kidnap 23-year-old Emily Highstand. Take a look. Bizarre twist in the murder of Natalie Holloway, the college student who disappeared in Aruba back in 2005. The man who claimed he helped dispose of her body has just been stabbed to death. Police say a Northport woman stabbed and killed a man who tried to kidnap her. His name is John Ludwig, and police say he had this place staked out as he waited for that woman to come by. But she instead turned the tables on him and took his life. But neighbors say they're most shocked to learn about his connection to the Natalie Holloway case. I thought I was going to die. 23-year-old Emily Haystand made this dramatic 911 call. Listen, he had a knife to my neck. He told me he was going to kill me if I didn't give him a key. She opens the door and boom. Takes the knife. Gives him a couple of those. He lets go. She runs into her home. Ludwig ran three blocks away and collapsed on Brisbane Drive. He later died. Yesterday he told me you just feel your feet. He said, why did you say that? I feel my feet. A private investigator on the Oxygen Network claims Ludwig told authorities he helped dig up Natalie Holloway's remains in 2005 and cremate them. Remains were found, but DNA testing showed they were from an animal. Now, a bizarre twist in a mystery disappearance that may never be solved. Before his death, Ludwig claimed to hold the key to unlocking one of America's most infamous mysteries. But did this troubled young man really have information that could finally shed some light on Natalie's mysterious disappearance? Emily says she became friends with Ludwig, but got more and more frightened as he confided secrets to her about covering up Natalie's murder. Emily claims as her fear grew, so did John's obsession with her until she claims she had to kill him to save her own life. Emily sat down with us exclusively just days after her attack. How are you doing? Um, I've been okay. I mean, before I left Florida, it was kind of rough. It's hard to be at my house now. But right. now that I'm here, it just doesn't really feel real. Yeah. But are you having hard times when you think about it? I mean, does um, it come back and kind of, flash since back I've through been your here, head? Just Especially. always think what could what could have happened, you yeah. know, like, um, what if I didn't get away? Yeah. How do you feel about the fact that that person that you knew is now dead? Um, honestly, I don't feel happy that he's gone. Um, I think it's really sad for his family and stuff, but it just was so many months of like harassment. He would call my parents, like anytime I would get into a relationship, it would just be destroyed instantly. I had him blocked on, like my Facebook account is so private, like he would always get through and it was just harassment like every day, all day. He's showed up at my work countless times, like he's tried to run up in my car before. I would be lucky enough to see him and lock the doors and be able to drive away. <laughs> So I feel a lot safer now that he's gone. How did you meet him to begin with? He was living with a friend of mine. That's how I met him, though, was through Gabe. Mm -hmm. And um, we were just kind of acquaintances. I would go hang out over at Gabe's house, and he would be there, and we didn't really talk much. And then when we did start talking, it wasn't like, you know, 
anything like we weren't like in romantic relationships anything i mean we were just friends oh you didn't ever date him i never dated him mm -hmm. i know it's on the media that i was his ex-girlfriend but we never dated well, I, I didn't know yeah mm -hmm. i actually the whole time i knew him I had a boyfriend for the most part because he did ask me a lot he, he had a girlfriend mm -hmm. um he asked me all the time if i would be with him and you know i was like no i i want to be with my boyfriend john got a hold of him on facebook and told him that we had been sleeping together and we're in love with each other and so there was just always a lot of drama there. We have a few mutual friends, not a lot, but one of my really good friends uh, that I talked to a lot, even up until this all happened, John was still talking to. He, he was telling him stuff like we were in love, we were doing really good in our relationship, we had a baby on the way. He was just really delusional, like really crazy. And ever since then, I, I stopped talking to him after that, and this was like eight months ago, and it just, never ended. Were you ever with him alone before? Like you go over there and your friend wasn't home or Gabe wasn't home and he was there? Yeah, I've been... Did he act strange? Did, did, he did you would notice? always just try and like, try to like ask me, like try to pay me to like do stuff with him. I don't know, just stuff like pretty much try to beg me to do anything with him. You said he would try like, to pay you? Yeah, like he would offer to pay me to like give him a kiss or you know, anything, just like anything. Like he was like devoted to like making me be with him, honestly, and it just got creepy. At first was I Was he serious? He was serious, yeah. The first thing that he ever had started with was that he offered me $500 and I was waiting for Gabe to get home. So, and I just was like creeped out by him. And I told him that, I was like, look, I have a boyfriend, you know, like you need to stop or I'm not gonna speak to you. And it was like, he was like obsessive from the moment I met him. So he did, he did what? He offered you $500 to do what? To perform a sex act? Yeah. And when you said no, how did he respond? He just like put his head down and went into his room. Like it was never ever, ever aggressive. Anything he did was never aggressive. It was a lot of threats like, oh, if you don't, you know, be my girlfriend, I'm gonna call your dad and tell him that, you know, just something crazy. Like, he called my dad and told him that I was pregnant with his child. He contacted my 80-year-old my grandmother and told her that I was pregnant with his child. Was there a point in there where you were scared of him? Honestly, uh, no. He would say threatening things, but I blocked his number. I blocked, I made my Facebook private. I made everything. And when he would get through to me, he would go online and make a number so he could text me, like textnow.com or whatever. Just saying stuff like, I forgive you for everything you've done, for having a boyfriend. I forgive you, I love you, I want to be with you. So you didn't get a restraining order? I never did, no. Did you ever talk to the police? And I didn't. A lot of times it was just text or he would call my family right. trying to get my family to get me to talk to him. Why did you not get a restraining order? I didn't get the restraining order because I felt like when I looked it up, it said it had to be kind of domestic and it kind of seemed like a lot you had to go through for court. I really wish I would have, but I feel like whether I did or didn't, what happened still would have happened. When was the first time he mentioned Natalie Holloway to you? It was probably like two months after, three months after I met him that I heard about the Holloway case. And I was just kind of creeped out by him after that and wanted to stay away from him. Well, how did he know um, this Vandersloot? How did he know him? He used to live in Aruba. His aunt owns a home there. He used to run her real estate company. I was always infatuated with the Holloway case. You know, I said, oh, I'm gonna, that Vanderstoot guy seems like a cool dude. I'd love to be his friend, you know. I had seen interviews with him, and I genuinely thought he'd be cool. I didn't care if he killed a girl, raped a girl, what he did, that wasn't me. All I cared about was I thought he'd be a cool-ass friend, and he, and he was. So I told my friends when I moved down there, I'm gonna meet him, and I'm gonna become his best friend. He actually, according to him, ran into him in a gas station or like a convenience store and you know was like you know oh i'm really intrigued by what you've done i want to be your friend i shook his hand i explained i just moved here from uh, virginia i don't have any friends he said uh you know maybe we can have a drink give me your number i'll call you later and sure enough he did and we spent every day together from february till may that's how they became friends according to him so what did john tell you Euron told him. He told me that Euron did do it. 
um, and hid the body. John told me that, you know, Yaron got this Natalie girl all drunk at a bar and Yaron took her to the beach and they were just having a good time and she started, you know, seizuring and foaming at the mouth. And Yaron called his dad, helped him dispose of the body. Five years later, I guess there was a bigger search that came out. They wanted to find the body. So Yaron paid John $30,000 to help dispose of the body. And there's so many different stories. It was always a different story. The first story I heard from him was that they they got the bones and took them to a creamer, crematory or whatever. And I guess in Aruba, there's, there is uh, places you can bring your animals and like bury them. So they mixed her bones with dog bones. They broke them up and mixed them with dog bones and she was cremated and dumped in the ocean. The main story that he's really started sticking with was that, and this is the one that I believe because it's just so sick, how can you even make something like this up? Him and Yaron, you know, went and got her body parts and crushed up her bones with hammers. He said it took like 24 hours to crush her skull and just crush every bit of bone and burn the skull, burn all the bones to get the hair and DNA off of them. And he said they put it in a burlap sack and, you know, they went and rented a boat from a fisherman because I guess there's fishermen up all night there. They rent their boats out and they took it out and dropped her remains. And I don't know, even after a while, he was saying that if I would be his girlfriend and prove my love to him, her body was hidden in the national forest and he would, you know, fly me to Aruba to find it. And the millions of dollars and rewards we could get, we would live like this great life. Like there was just so many stories. Like, did you believe any of them? I did for a long time, and um, which one did you believe? The one the, that you said took so long, yeah, crush up with the hammer, yeah, which was on the oxygen. What he told them. Did he tell you where Natalie's remains were? Coming up. I just pulled into my house. I took my keys out of the ignition, put them in my pocket, and opened my door. Swear I won't forget this, why do I regret this? In my mind reckless, thoughts are feeling endless Sitting up I'm breathless, anxiety's infectious I feel so defenseless, betrayed and embarrassed I hate being open, I hate being broken I feel like an ocean filled up with emotion Anger ain't a potion, rub it on like lotion I can feel it soaking, reopen, the scars have awoken I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go
I think that he was sitting in my other car because I heard a bang and he was just running. I mean, I saw him and I knew immediately I was just going to be like, oh God, that's John. We now return to Dr. Phil's exclusive interview. There was just so many stories. Like, Did you believe any of them? I did for a long time. and um, Which one did you believe? The one... The, that you said took so long? Yeah. Crush up with the hammer? Yeah, which was on oxygen, what he told them. After he told you that, were you around him at all? No, I tried to not be around him at all. Did he tell you where Natalie's remains were? He never told me, like, this is exactly it. He told me that if we were ever to be in Aruba and went in the National Forest, he would be able to find them. But he also did tell me, your aunt taught him to never be honest, never tell the truth, always, always lie. So I feel like everything that ever came out of his mouth is a lie. I don't know if he honestly was a part of it. Maybe your aunt told him what he did, and that's where the six stories come from. I honestly don't know. He literally was delusional. Do you believe he helped your aunt or not? I did at first. He had so many stories, you know, all the stuff about crushing her skull. And he just said and did sick things. He thought it was funny that you're on date raped girls and he just thought sick stuff like that was funny. I just don't know, I did. And then when he said, you know, always lie, always lie. I wasn't a part of it, always lie. Like, cause his name started getting out there and he just didn't want the publicity. So I just don't know, I just don't know. Well, this is a transcript of TJ Ward, a private investigator talking to John. Where did you take her remains, John? to my property, T.J. Ward, to your aunt's house, John. Originally, we had discussed bedding it cremated, but at the time, it was legal, but apparently some places would do it for pets. T.J. Ward, and what did you do, John? The idea was to crush everything to the point where it wasn't recognizable as her bones or skull or anything like that. T.J. Ward, did you do something to the remains before you broke them up, or did you do something with the remains after you broke them up? Did you burn them? John, the only thing that got burned was the skull to burn the hair fibers. It was doused in gasoline in a fire pit in a cave. Had he told you that? Yeah, he said that where they did it was in a cave. I didn't know it was if it was on his aunt's property, yeah. but he's always said it was in a cave. Was it funny to him or was it just to impress you? I guess it depends what kind of mood or what kind of drugs he was on that day. 
John used drugs heavily. I think that he thought it was all funny, the date raping of the girls. But I just felt like it was all so fake and such a lie. Did he break into your car at one point? Yes. And did what? Um, well, there's times he, he was definitely stalking me. I mean, how did he know I got home at 6.30 every morning? How uh -huh. did he know that day that I did? There was a time he broke into my car and stole documents I had from the hospital. And just anything he could, any evidence that I, Emily gave this to me and we're together, he would, I mean, that's the only thing that he was ever able to get out of my car that was like mm -hmm. a big deal. But um, otherwise, there was one time that I was driving and he got in and he tried to grab my phone from me. And it was when I had just met my boyfriend and I posted a picture of us on Facebook and he wanted my phone and he said he deserves to know who he is and he's gonna kill him and he needed his name and it was in a public parking lot thank god and instead of just sitting in the car and trying to fight with him i ran inside and that's why i really was telling him like john i'm gonna get the police involved okay he contacted me on my way to work i told my manager like after this i'm going to get a police report and i i bartend i work late i didn't get off to like 2.33 in the morning, so I just didn't think about it after work, um, and it was the next morning that happened. So you were just about to get the police involved. Mm -hmm. It was ramping It was up. like, it was that night, but I just got off so late. So where were you when you were attacked? Let's, let's, I just, let's take me through the process. Um, I work late, I bartend. Um, I have a six-year-old little girl, so every morning I get up, um, I go to my boyfriend's and sleep there. I live with my mom, so my mom has her overnight. Um, get up, go home every day, 6.30 in the morning, every single day for like the last two months now. Um, I pulled into my driveway. I was sitting in my driveway. He had to have been stalking me. Like, you think he followed I... you from that boyfriend's house? I think he was He was waiting at my house. He, he was, was ahead of you. At my house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just pulled into my house, you know, I took my keys out of the ignition, put them in my pocket, and I was texting my boyfriend, you know, like, have a good day at work, I love you. So I kind of had my phone in my hand, went to grab everything, and saw him running up. I think that he was sitting in my other car because I heard a bang and he was just running. I mean, my driveway's like, okay, part of it goes straight and then part of it curves off, like it's a roundabout. So I was not far from him at all. I think he jumped out of my car and ran at me. I saw him and I knew immediately, I was just thinking like, oh God, that's John. I went to close the door and closed him in it. So the other car was on your left? Yeah, I didn't see him. I don't know if he ran from the side of the house and you know, ran into my trash can, but I just heard a bang, looked over, and it was just, he was right there. Coming up. I just started swinging back. It was just literally like, I was swinging back like this, because he got me down like this. He had his arm around my throat, and I just started swinging backwards. And when I knew that he wasn't letting go, I put all my strength into it, and I was like, I'm getting away from this. How did you get the knife away from me? Dr. Phil's exclusive interview continues. Northport police say Ludwig ambushed a woman in the driveway at knife point. The woman wrestled away the knife and stabbed Ludwig several times before she escaped. Another woman who wishes to remain anonymous says she saw the attack. Young lady was standing there and a man was grasping her from behind and there was quite a struggle. It was six in the morning, it was dark, but I didn't see him. I don't know if he ran from the side of the house and, you know, ran into my trash can, but I just heard a bang, looked over, and it was just, he was right there. I closed him into my door, and he got on top of me. I was screaming. He started shoving something in my mouth and was kind of on top of me, so I couldn't talk and I couldn't move. And he just kept saying, you know, do what the f I tell you or I'm going to slit your throat. Um, he had a knife to my throat. He's shoving something in my mouth and I can't talk and I don't know if he pulled it out and I just put my hands up I was like John I'm listening to you what do you want me to do I'll do whatever you want he is able to just kind of shove me into the passenger seat he got in and he has a knife to my throat with his left hand and he goes to start the car and realizes the keys aren't in the ignition and you can tell he's like you know what do I do and he's like you know give me the f keys or I'm gonna slit your f throat I was like, okay, like, I'm doing whatever you want me to do. I reached into my pocket, and I just grabbed the knife like, by the blade. So, like, my fingers here got cut a little, so this part must have been on the black part, but I'm like this, and I hurried up and grabbed my door and kicked it open and was able to, you know, start to step out, and he had me by the throat, and I just kept going. Like, I pulled myself out of that car. Like, I think I pulled him. So I'm standing up at this point, and he's got his arm around me, 
and he was able to get himself out of the car and I, you know, kind of swung the knife back slowly, like warning him, like, let go of me. And I did that a couple of times and I'm thinking he's not letting go. Like, it's either me or him right now. Like, I'm not coming out of this. It's me or him. So I just kept swinging back like as hard as I could. And I didn't even know that I struck him. I had no idea. As soon as I felt myself being released, I ran, like I ran. I didn't even look back. I did not even look back. I thought that he was still out there. So you were able to get to the door? Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. But you're getting out of the car and you're standing up and he's still got a hold of you. Yeah. And show me how you were swinging the knife back. I mean, I got out of the car. I don't even know if I was all the way out, but when I grabbed the knife, the blade's facing this way. So yeah. when I had my hand around this way, I just started swinging back. It was just literally like, I was just swinging back like this, because he's got me like down like this. Like he had his arm around my throat and I just started swinging backwards. And when I knew that he wasn't letting go, I just put all my strength into it. And I was like, I'm getting away from this. How did you get the knife away from him? I grabbed it by the blade. I didn't even think, I just happened so fast. I don't even know how I thought. I didn't even, I don't even know. Did you twist it or? It, he he had to be on drugs. It, it was too easy. It just happened too easy for me. So I don't even know why I did that. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to grab this knife from him. It just was like, it just happened. Like, I just grabbed it. Well, I'm sure he didn't expect it for one thing. No, not at all. Like, it was just and, so fast. Did it cut your hand? Um, not too bad. This part, I think, got, you know, the, it was like a kitchen knife. So this must have been on the black part. And this, my, the blade must have got like right here, yeah. a little bit right here next. Mm -hmm. But were you bleeding? Yeah, when the cops took pictures of my hands, it was just covered in my face. The, my mouth was like bruised all the way up here, like. From what he stuffed in it? Yeah. Do I you mean, know yet what it was? I don't. Um, the bottom part didn't get caught up at all. I think it was some kind of glove, you know, where the top is rough. Because when the cops found him, he, he had gloves on and they found his backpack up the road, which had duct tape in it and gloves and some more knives. He had more knives, duct tapes and gloves in his backpack. Well, the day before, what I started saying when he got a hold of me on a girl Lauren's account, he kept saying, you know, he was pretending to be her. But I could tell it was him because the way he, he would type paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs. He was messaging me, oh, like, you know, you messed John up so bad. He loves you so much. If you don't take him back, he's not going down alone. And I was like, you know, all I had to say to that was, please leave me alone. I'm not talking to you about John. And then further on, I realized it was him and I said, listen, John, if you don't leave me alone, I'm getting the police involved. And um, the last thing he said to me was, you just signed your will to live. And the next day he came to my house. Coming up. What was he going to do? Where was he going to take me in my own car? What was his plan? It's scary. Like, I feel like he was going to, like, torture me. What did you think when you heard that there was a backpack with duct tape, knives, and gloves? Now return to Dr. Phil's exclusive interview. He must have been hiding behind my other car because I heard somebody run over and I knew it was him and I started screaming right away and I couldn't close the door quick enough. And he got in, he had like a face mask. He could only see his eyes. Like there was like a handkerchief maybe over okay, And you're sure it was him, him, correct? Hold on. I heard him talk. He was telling me he was going to kill me if I didn't give him the keys because he got me in the car. And he had a knife to my neck the whole time. I said, listen, John, if you don't leave me alone, I'm getting the police involved. And um, the last thing he said to me was, you just signed your will to live. And the next day he came to my house and I think he wanted to, I don't know if he was just going to like go kill himself and try and kill me on top of it. I don't know. And when, when he released you, you didn't even know at that point that you had stabbed him i had no idea i didn't know i didn't i didn't even know why i thought he was still out there i just ran i didn't even look back i didn't see him fall down i didn't see and you him. ran into the house yeah like this and is my car and child were in there yeah my mom had heard me screaming she met me at the door like she was opening the door when i was running in and i just slammed the doors and locked every door in the house and i was like mom he's out there call the cops and it was just terrible i feel like my daughter is probably traumatized where is he now? I don't know. He's probably in my yard. He probably ran away. I got the knife from him and I stabbed him. 
Um, actually, there was somebody in black standing right where, you know, he would have fell because there's like, you know, my driveway and we were on the other side of the car and then there's like, you know, some trees. Um, so I was like, oh my God, he's out there. I'm freaking out because, you know, they don't let you hang up on the phone with them. And then the cops put their flashlights on. It was actually a police. They had already found him by then. Like, here's my house. Um, it's the first house on the street. So you take your left and there's the main road. They found him on the way to my house right in the main road. He didn't make it very far at all. So he had run away. Yeah, he did. He tried to get away. And how far did he make it? Mm, not even like a quarter of a mile. Just made it to the road? Yeah. And collapsed, collapsed in the middle of the road? I just keep thinking what would happen if not. They didn't tell me that he had passed. I mean, I kept telling the cop, you're going to take him to jail and he's going to get out and do the same thing. I really thought like he was going to get out and I would be dead like in any time now. And where was the stab wound? I believe it says online his abdomen. I have no idea if that's the truth or not. Because, was there more than one? Um, I'm not sure. Not. I, there, I'm sure that there was because I s just kept swinging until I was let go of, but I don't know. I mean, I haven't, I don't believe the police have released the official report. And, How many times did you swing backwards? I mean, probably like nine or 10, because I did slowly a few times and I realized like he, he's not letting go, like he's not phased by it. So probably like five or six more times, just yeah. as hard as I could. So what did you think when you heard that there was a backpack with duct tape, knives, and gloves? I mean, that was really scary to me. What was he going to do? Where was he going to take me in my own car? Like, what was his plan? It's scary. Like, I feel like he was going to torture me. And I don't know. Part of me is like, I've never seen him be crazy like that. So I'm like, was he just going to try and scare me? into being with him, or would he have really killed me? I have no idea, honestly. What do you think made him snap? Because he had been all talk for a while, but then he had rushed your car a few times. He broke into your car. He violated your space. He I... comes at you with a knife at your throat. Yeah. That's, that's a whole other category of behavior. Okay. Is there something you can point to that made him snap? Coming up. There's a video that Gabe's making viral that we got in a car together and drove away. Mr. John? What? How does it feel to have uh, Emily's boyfriend out of the picture? He's good. Huh? He's great. Dr. Phil's exclusive interview continues. Emily met John Ludwig the man she eventually stabbed to death to save her own life through a mutual friend named Gabriel Madrigal. She says Gabriel, who says he has worked for years to uncover clues about the Natalie Holloway case, befriended John solely to try and get answers out of him about what he knew about Natalie. Now, Emily says Gabriel encouraged her to pump John for information as well. Gabriel shot lots of videos of John during their friendship. I'm going to explain about how John got killed. I'm just going to throw it out there. I know who did it. I know who did it. It wasn't her. Gabriel Madrigal and others on his Facebook page believe another man involved with the victim killed Ludwig, but witness accounts and police say there's no evidence of a third person involved. I mean, he I... comes at you with a knife at your throat. Yeah. That's, that's a whole other category of behavior. Right. Is, is there something you can point to that made him snap? I think it's just when I met my boyfriend, I mean, I think he just really realized, like, I'm not going to be with him. And I don't know why it took him so long to realize. At first, until I found out about the Natalie stuff, we were kind of friends. I mean, there's a video that Gabe's making viral that we got in a car together and drove away. Well, it's a video of John inside of Gabe's car. Mr. John? What? How does it feel to have uh, Emily's boyfriend out of the picture. Yeah. Huh? He's great. I mean, we were friends. Like, there's no denying that. Like, we hung out, we went to eat together sometimes, but it was never romantic, anything like that. I had a boyfriend. I made that clear to him. What are you trying to do with your life right now? I'm trying to spend time with her. It's the only thing I'm worried about. Okay, now, you met him through who? Gabe. Okay. Gabe, mm -hmm. and what has he been saying? He's saying that John called my phone and my boyfriend picked up and yelled at him. So John rode his bike to my house 
and confronted him at the door. And my boyfriend pulled a knife on him and stabbed him. And John was running away because he's scared. He's saying that my boyfriend rode off on John's bike after he stabbed him. And I was too scared to tell the cops the truth because my boyfriend told me to tell the police that it was in self-defense and John attacked me. Mm -hmm. He's saying stuff like that. So that didn't happen. There's all the proof in the world. I mean, the police have my phone records. For about at least six months now, he's been harassing me and I would just say, you know, leave me alone. I don't want to be your friend anymore. Well, he says he has videos of you and I think I've seen a few of them. Yeah, those were in May uh, last year. So the, the, about Where you say ago. you're not afraid of him? Of John? Right. That was when I had just, that was just like two months after I met him. I think John's a good person. He just did some stupid <laughs> So those were way, yeah. way early. Yeah. I mean, I've only known John for about a year. and that, But that the was true at the time. May. Yeah. The videos he has were in May. And I was like, oh, you know, little John wouldn't hurt a fly. But he had me come over and do a couple interviews saying, you know, how do you feel about John now? And I said, you know, it's creepy and what he did is disgusting and he deserves to be punished for it. But I mean, obviously if he would have posted the whole videos rather than just the parts that make it look like um, like a friend of John's, then people would understand, yeah, we were friends for a short period of time. And then there was a time where Gabe tried to, you know, get me to kind of get the truth about the Natalie case out about him. And then there was a time when I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I don't want to be around John. It's scary at this point. And he just became obsessed. So your feelings changed after those videos were taken? Yeah, absolutely. So the police have said it already, but clear this up once and for all. Are you the one who killed John Ludwig in self-defense? Coming up. Sometimes I feel like I'm like a murderer. You know, but then sometimes I'm just like, you know, I did what I had to do. Like, I have a daughter. Like, If you had this to do over again, would you do it any differently? We now return to Dr. Phil's exclusive interview. So the police have said it already, but clear this up once and for all. Are you the one who killed John Ludwig in self-defense? Yes. No doubt. Yeah, nobody you was there. You and only you. And where was your current boyfriend when this I happened? I had just left his house. He works at 6 in the morning every day. His boss picks him up for work every day. You know, right after I called the police, I called him. He came to my house. The detective saw him pull up with his boss. I was completely by myself. They actually had a witness who was walking her dog, and I can't imagine. She saw pretty much the whole thing. Young lady was standing there and a man was grasping her from behind and there was quite a struggle and eventually she broke loose from him I saw her run into the house screaming what sounded like mom mom I assume this person Gabe knows that when forensics are done they'll be able to determine the angle of attack of the knife and yeah. how it came in and well yeah he even said I, when he made one of his conspiracy videos oh well just wait till the work you know the murder weapons fingerprinted because emily's dna is not going to be on there and it's like the, there's only going to be mine and john's and you know i had my daughter in system has taken over and even now five days later you're still amped up expect that to go down but you can't stay that way forever so adrenaline's going to go down Cameras are going to go away, headlines are going to go away, people are going to move on to the next story. Yeah. And the silence is going to be deafening. Yeah. And two things are going to happen, and I want to tell you what they are. The silence is going to be deafening. Yeah. And two things are going to happen, and I want to tell you what they are so you can say this is exactly what Dr. Phil told me about. Right. One is you're going to be hit with the gravity of the fact that you have killed someone. Yeah. You're going to second guess yourself. You're going to wonder if you could have just wrestled yourself away or you could have, because you're a caring person, you're going to, you're going to turn it over in your mind a thousand times. And then secondly, you're very likely to start replaying this in your head and 
Maybe it's that time of day, maybe it's a loud noise, maybe it's a smell that you experienced at that time, but there are triggers that can take you back to that moment where yeah. it's really traumatic for you. And yeah. I'll give you a couple of pieces of advice. One is talk about it. Yeah. I mean, to your mother, to your boyfriend, to a counselor, to, it's very cathartic to talk about your feelings. It helps to give it a voice and get it out there. Right. and get people's perspective on it and watch for the signs look you're going to have some ups and downs you're going to cry you're going to be upset you're going to feel down about it and that's natural and it's normal for a period of time but if right. it starts getting too dark if it starts getting too prolonged then recognize you need some help with it yeah and that's okay but when this starts to happen don't think you know have i have i lost it here am i losing my bearings? Am I going insane? Just know these are very normal, common reactions to that sort of thing. And there's help for that. Right. And don't deny yourself that. Don't think, well, if I just don't think about it, it'll go away. No, it, it won't. You, you need to talk about it and ask right. for the help when you need it. Right. When the dust settles, you, you'll come to realize that nobody ever wants to kill someone else. And if there was any other way to do this, I'm sure that any reasonable person would want to take that. But if you're faced with the decision of letting this man with a knife to your throat take your daughter's mother away or do what you have to do to get loose, you protected your daughter's mother. Right. It could have gone completely the other direction. Yeah. And you fought for your life and, you know, he put himself in harm's way and it's, it's unfortunate, but you didn't choose this. Yeah. He chose this when he attacked you. Yeah. And that's what you need to remember. He chose this, not you. Right. Okay? Okay. And you stay in touch with us, okay? Okay. Because we'll help you here. Right. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. I want to thank Emily for bravely sharing her story. She sat down for this interview just a few days after surviving her attack. Her bruises still fresh, and we commend her strength and hope she continues to heal. Let Emily's story be a lesson to young women out there. If you're afraid or you have a gut feeling something is wrong, don't ignore that. If you feel you're in danger, go to the police. Attempt to get a restraining order. Do whatever you can to protect yourself. For more information, go to drphil.com. Thanks for watching.